From the dawn of video game time, video games have taken time. Now, that is certainly a stupid sentence, but I'm a stupid man, and it's technically the perfect preface to what is hopefully not an entirely stupid video. But in all honesty, despite game prices staying roughly the same over the last 30 years or so, games have continually gotten longer and longer, as gamers like myself have gotten hungrier and hungrier for a game that they can really sink their G Fuel stained teeth into. Now, there's a big difference between a game like Final Fantasy XIV with 17 years of developmental experience, 40,000 playable zones, 57 and a two-thirds classes, and enough cat ears to attract a stadium of Discord mods, and a game like Stray, which can be completed in an afternoon, while taking a nap with your controller off. It's easy to look at these games and go, look, I'm no economist, don't be calling me no Adam Smith, but these two games should probably cost different amounts of money. But in reality, Stray, that game that can be beaten in an absent afternoon, costs $30. While you can get hundreds of hours for free just by downloading the trial of Final Fantasy XIV. And to me, this seemed unfair. So I pledged to get to the bottom of this. I pledged to figure out how long a game should take in order for it to be considered a good use of both your time and your money. And of course, there are so many factors at play here, but I wanted to see if there was a concrete answer. An hour amount that you should expect to receive for every dollar you spend on a video game. As Adam Smith would say, your return on investment. I mean, actually, Adam Smith would likely start talking about an invisible hand and say that that invisible hand of the market perhaps to mom, he's doing it again. Anyways, with a goal in mind, I set off. I put on my Nintendo patented detective hat and I got down to sleuthing. But first, I took a moment to thank the sponsor of today's video, Into the AM, who is both sponsoring this video and clothing me today, which is a lifesaver for the YouTube community guidelines. Check them out at the link in the description and there'll be more on them later. After setting off on my adventure, the first step, rather unsurprisingly, was realizing that I had already fucked up. Comparing Stray, a single player linear experience with Final Fantasy XIV, a massively multiplayer online role playing game slash anime simulator with drastically more descriptor words was hardly a fair fight. So right off the bat, I came to the conclusion that we have to remove two types of games from this argument entirely. The first would be multiplayer games, or any games as a service garbage. Polished, repeatable experiences that get most of their value through interactions with other people, uh, sounds a lot more like real life than a game to me. It's just really hard to judge your return on investment with these games. They're often free, but then they have these hidden costs, like when you slip on a banana and you accidentally buy 2,000 V-Bucks after seeing Naruto in the shop, which I'm not speaking from experience here, it's just something that could happen. But really, any game that gets a continuous IV drip of content to keep its player base addicted for years of gameplay can't really be accurately squared up here. That means no MMOs, no first person shooters, no battle royales, and certainly no MOBAs. MOBAs actually go in a separate category, which I like to call hell. But another type of game that I'm gonna exclude are roguelikes and souls-likes. These games are almost entirely different experiences with the length of the game and, and the length of the service varying drastically depending on how leet, that's leet with two threes, how late of a gamer you are. I mean, some people can finish Bloodborne in 21 minutes, and some people like me can never finish Bloodborne because it's scaly. Of course, there are still gonna be some massive differences in playtime, but I think taking out these two extremes makes it a bit easier to digest. Although, there are always outliers. So with the nitpicky and unnecessary ground rules laid out, I got down to business. And before long, I remembered the original piece of content that got me thinking about this concept in the first place. You see, back in 2015, I used to listen to gaming podcasts while I mowed the lawn, which is something that only cool people do. And one of those podcasts that I listened to the most during those golden years was Funhouse. This was back when they had their perfect cast and when they would basically just talk about gaming news for an hour or so, but it was endlessly entertaining. But one one thing that always stuck out to me was this rogue theory from one of their founding members, Sean Poole, better known as Spool, which I can only imagine has its roots in the legendary Spork, which is sick. Whenever they talk about a game, he'd basically put it to the test of $1 one hour, meaning for every dollar that they paid for the game, he expected them to get one hour of entertainment out of it. So if you paid $60 for a game, you would need to get at least $60 worth of content or else it wasn't worth it. 
And as you can guess, much like when I show my friends my gaming PC, he was met with a sea of laughter every time. No one took him seriously, and he was lovingly ridiculed for sticking to his guns, but this goofy theory was for years my personal basis for determining if a game was worth it or not, and it even poured into other aspects of my life, ultimately having me reevaluating how much I was spending on anything and ending up forming surprisingly good spending habits because of it. God, don't you hate it when you accidentally become fiscally responsible? Oops. So for a while, this was my barometer, and I came to two conclusions because of it. First, this theory was overly simplistic and wildly inaccurate for the majority of games. And second, life is really expensive. Let that sink in. When you're comparing it with going to the movies for two hours for 20 bucks or watching a three hour Broadway show for $100, a $60 or $50 copy of God of War starts to look really good. And this is a game that technically fails the $1 one hour test as it only took me personally 23 hours to beat it. Of course, God of War has more content if you want to go and get 100%, and, and that's going to take you about 50 hours to fully complete, but for me personally, from booting the game until I saw the credits and cried, I was basically paying $2.15 per hour of gameplay. And yet, despite failing the test, it is literally able to provide 15 times the length of entertainment when being compared with a Broadway show, despite being almost half the cost of a Broadway ticket. And of course, coming from someone who is refusing to compare Dark Souls to Skyrim, it's quite ridiculous to compare a live action play with professional actors to a video game that I can play in my house, but it's just something to keep in mind as we move forward. Most of the time, video games are able to provide a pretty crazy, wacky, and ultimately wild amount of experience and call me old fashioned, but I think that's pretty cool. So with all these variables in mind, I came to my conclusion. I came to the conclusion that a game should take as long as it needs to. Thanks for watching, Bye bye Guys, oldest trick in the book. I didn't actually finish the video, dummies. But no, I, I hated this answer. It sounded like the answer that the teacher would give you in high school English. Maybe it was technically correct, but it bummed me out. But at the end of the day, you can't deny that it's true. Video games are meant to be entertaining and engaging, so technically, if a game has a long and an intricate story to tell, like in Dragon Quest XI, it should take longer than a game with a simple story that doesn't want to overstay its welcome, like Stray. But comparing these games had me even more upset, and if I'm being honest, Strays should have been longer. And on that note, Dragon Quest XI probably should have been shorter. So I went back to the drawing board and I began by dissecting my favorite games one by one. My personal favorite game of all time is probably The Witcher 3. According to how long to beat, The Witcher takes about 51 hours just for the main story, although it personally took me over 100 hours and a few tragic summers indoors, pasty white, to beat it. Oh, okay. In terms of raw value, I'd put Witcher up there with Skyrim and Red Dead, and the fact that for the time that they came out and their retail price at release, they offer more content than the price indicates. At around $60, they all offer about 30 to 50 hours of story, close to 200 hours of an open world to explore, and due to their genius design and that sense of wonder that they're able to encapsulate in their world, this playtime can often end up being way more. I know a lot of people that have thousands of hours in these games alone, myself included. But of course, it was unfair to only look at my favorite games, because they were good experiences and I was biased to think that they were a good use of my time. So I put my finance degree to work and I opened up Excel. Now I'll make this quick so I don't bore anyone too much, including myself, but I looked at the top 126 Metacritic games of all time to sift through the top 20 games released since the year 2010, which is what I would deem to be modern. First of all, I want to note that the rose-colored glasses on Metacritic are insanely tinted. Like, they must be impossible to see through because the fact that it took me over over 125 titles to get to the top 20 released since the year 2010 is ludicrous. For every one title in the last 12 years, they had like 10 from the 2000s. And as a 90s kid, you'd think I would agree with them, but I didn't at all. But regardless of the shortcomings of game critics everywhere, except me, of course, who's never been wrong, I plugged the top 20 modern games into Excel. And I did decide to include Elden Ring despite it technically being a Souls-like because you know, the open world nature allows for a greater player base to experience it, and 
because I really like it and I wanted to include it, sue me, I guess strike one, Meraki was wrong. But once I had the 20 games in, I plugged in how long it would take to beat each game according to how long to beat.com. There was a nice variety and a theory was starting to form in my monkey brain, but to ensure every game was being judged fairly, I adjusted play times for their price at release to reflect a $60 game, which led to me boosting portals by 20% and Disco Elysiums by 50%. After I input the times to beat, I then went through and I input the times that it took the average player to complete the game, that, that it took them to explore every nook and cranny the game has to offer, and then I put that in a separate column. I added a little bit of coloring to appeal to my child brain, and I quickly began to stare intensely at the data until I came to a conclusion. First, the obvious. The quickest game to beat was about 10 hours long, and the longest was a big outlier of 97. Having a game that takes nearly 10 times longer to beat be the same price but rated the same as a game that took only 10 was a bit ridiculous, but Persona 5 is notoriously long and one of those accursed JRPGs, which I honestly would have clumped along with the rogue likes and souls likes if I was being smart. But looking at all the games that I rounded up, the average hours to finish a game was about 33, and the average hours to complete a game was about 100. On average, you would spend about double the amount of time messing around in the game's world after beating it than beating the main story. and. That sounds about perfect in my experience. If I love a game to keep playing after I see the credits roll, knowing that I have basically two games worth of content to explore is a super exciting concept, and to me that's extremely satisfying. It makes it sound like you're watching a movie trilogy and beating the main story was just the first movie of the three. The other two you get to make for yourself using the remainder of the game's content, unless you're playing Skyrim, which leaves you with like six movies more content to fill after beating the main story. Guess I should name my next Skyrim character Harry Potter. Uh. But I'm getting off track. Even though I thought this was super interesting and satisfying to discover, I needed to get down to business. So I added another column, dollars per hour. Finally, after years of using the theory in the back of my head to delegate whether things were worth my time, I could finally put Spool's concept to the test. Finally, I could use data to figure out if he was right or if he was wrong. And yeah, he was wrong. But he wasn't too far off, because according to the top 20 games of the modern era, the average amount you could expect to pay per hour of top tier gameplay is about $1.80. So using that logic, for a $60 game, Paying a buck eighty per dollar, you can expect a game to last around 33 hours. And you probably remember that number, it's the same as the average. I kind of forgot how math works, so I wasn't too surprised, but I'm still glad that we assigned a dollar amount to it, like the pure blooded capitalist American that I am. So a $60 game should last 33 hours, a $30 game should last 16, and a $10 game should last about five, right? Well, Yes and no. I mean, sure, by this logic and this analysis, a $60 game that takes 34 or more hours to beat is technically a great deal, but that doesn't really mean that it's a good game. I realized by only looking at the top 20 games, I wasn't giving myself an accurate pool of data. It was important to look at these games to see what the baseline should be, but just to torture myself, I brought three of the most bloated open world games into my Excel document the new Assassin's Creed titles. Now all three of these titles are technically good deals and Valhalla is actually able to attain that golden $1 equals one hour ratio, but I would rather scoop my eyeballs out with a melon baller than sit through 60 hours of Ubisoft's generic ass story content. These are all examples of games that could benefit from being shorter rather than longer and from being more precise. So sadly, the magic number of $1.80 per hour can't be used to determine if a game is good, but rather only if it's a good deal. I mean, it's still useful, but my honest answer to how long a game should take to beat is still as long as it needs to be. Please stop booing guys, it, it brings up this weird phobia about ghosts. But seriously, some stories take longer to tell, and some games are based on simple concepts that only require a few hours to convey without overstaying their welcome. You know, like, we all used to have that one friend who would stay over for hours after you guys were done hanging out, sitting on the couch like he was invoking squatter's rights. You and your mom would be planning ways to kick him out behind his back. Maybe we light him on fire. In the video game world, that friend's name is Assassin's Creed. So maybe in a perfect parallel world where consumers aren't obsessed with even numbers, we could have games simply take the number of hours they take to beat and multiply that by 1.8 to get their retail price. But then games like Persona 5 would cost 
$176. What is this? 1920s Germany hyperinflation joke? But in the meantime, I should really shut up and stop complaining. I'm sure you've already commented something similar, but seriously, Games are a good deal, especially when you take into account game deals. Comparing the cost of an hour's worth of gameplay to the cost of an alternative entertainment source almost always leaves games winning in terms of value, especially when you use the price that it takes for the average player to 100% one of these top 20 games, which was 60 cents per hour, by the way. Games beat movies, dinners, plays, magic shows, bowling alleys, birthday parties you weren't invited to, you name it, games usually win. Plus, you get to stay inside and not engage with the outside world, which is a huge win in my book. But sometimes gamers, we have to be brave and face the outside world. And if we're gonna be doing something so courageous and bold, we might as well look good doing it. But don't worry, I've got your back. You might have noticed this little number I've got on right now, and you've probably been waiting this entire video for me to spill the beans, but the wait is over, and it's all thanks to today's sponsor, Into the AM. Into the AM makes premium, high-quality apparel, and I've honestly found myself wearing their shirts 10 times more than shirts that cost an arm and a leg more. Even before I got the sponsorship, my dad was a fan, I'm now a huge fan, and I'm sure that you'd be a fan too if you gave them a chance. They're also currently running a deal that lets you get three basic tees, with or without the logo, for just 50 bucks, and I can't recommend them enough. They're comfy, they fit well, and they're affordable, which sounds like a win-win-win to me. If you want to learn more or check out the products they have, you can use the link in my description for an additional 10% off or code Meraki at checkout, which also does help to support the channel. So we've answered the question of how long it should take to beat a game, and we've even figured out how much a game should cost per hour of main story gameplay and per hour to complete. The only question that's remaining is how long this video should take. Thankfully, I also had an Excel spreadsheet for this as well, and the answer Answer is, well, 17 minutes. <laughs> Nailed it. Anyways, thank you guys all so much for watching. I'll see you guys in the next one. And until next time, this has been Meraki. Bye bye.